Hello and welcome back to Classic Doctor Who Reviews. Today I will be taking a look at the Androids of Tara, not to be confused with the Androids of Death. This four-parter is from Season 16, also known as The Key to Time. Now, because it's the fourth serial of the season, it sees the Doctor, Romana and K-9 set out to find the fourth piece of the Key to Time. But the Doctor's feeling a bit tired, so he decides to take a day off and go fishing. Which is exactly what he does, and charges Romana with going out and finding the fourth key piece. Which is exactly what she does! Yep, seven and a half minutes into the first episode, and she's already found the fourth key piece. Oh well, job's done, time to move on, and what the f*** is that?! Is is it gone? Okay, good. I don't know what the heck that thing was, but not to worry, because as soon as it arrives, it leaves and is never seen or referenced again. Um, so obviously that's not how the story ends, because Romana is immediately rescued by this shady bugger called Count Grendel. This guy gives me the ick. Ugh. Uh, the character, not the actor, who's actually remarkable in the role. He has a real... Roger Delgado look to him, and sort of acts a bit like him as well. I could easily see him being the next incarnation of the Master. Maybe it's the beard. I actually found out that the actor, Peter Jeffrey, passed away from cancer on Christmas Day, 1999. That really sucks. Sorry to bum you out. Nevertheless, he gets added to the list of phenomenal Doctor Who villain actors. Getting back on topic, if I had to choose one word to describe this serial, it would be solid. A fairly solid tale of royal assassination attempts and failed hostage exchanges. Oh, and robots. Oh, androids, you know what I mean. And funnily enough, for a story called The Androids of Tara, there's not a lot of androids running around. I kind of just assumed it would be more like Robot of Sherwood, but the androids aren't the focus. More focus is put on the political intrigue. Look, I, I know I make a lot of comparisons to Game of Thrones. Pretty much any time kings and queens and knights and stuff like that appears in classic Doctor Who, I make that comparison, but I, I, I can't help it. Game of Thrones really was the go-to example of political intrigue when it was at its peak. I don't really have much negative to say about it. It's not a particularly exciting venture, for the most part, but I was never bored while watching it. And the pacing was, like, the best I had seen in ages. Everything just flowed so well, and there wasn't a moment of wasted time. It's more than decent, with a dosage of camp charm, especially in the music department. There were multiple instances where I had to wonder to myself, what the heck am I listening to? There are some great examples of night shoots in real-world filming locations that look so good. There's something about having all these actors in full costume running around a real castle outside in the middle of the night that just adds this, this much-needed authenticity that was greatly appreciated. If I had to choose one thing that could have used improving, then I would have to say that Mary Tam could have done a lot more to diversify her performance as Princess Strella. You see, in this serial, she gets a dual role as both Romana and this captured princess that just so happens to look identical to her. Problem is, she acts the exact same as both characters. Same accent, same vocal inflections, even a similar personality. Heck, they're both wearing purple. It's not a bad thing, mind you. Just noticeable. 
To be fair, when William Hartnell inexplicably had a dual role back in The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve, I think it was, he didn't change up his acting for the other character at all either. But my boy Patrick Troughton did for Enemy of the World to the benefit of that story. Ah, well, it's not the worst thing Romana's done. No, that award might just have to go to this outfit. What even is it? Looks like she's dressed as a cross between the Joker and Willy Wonka. Yikes. Oh, and she gets a really good uh, character moment where she shows her competency by escaping the bad guy's lair, only to be immediately recaptured again in the same scene. Ah, <sighs> companions, am I right? And I have to give some love to K-9. He doesn't get a lot to do in most recent serials, but at least he's a constant presence. He's almost replaced the sonic screwdriver as a get-out-of-jail-free card whenever the Doctor needs to be rescued. And he is getting a lot of use out of his laser beam snout. Do not boop that snoot. And the Doctor is pretty cool as well. well. You can't be expected to infiltrate the enemy lair, rescue the damsel, and save the day all by yourself, one man alone? Oh, no, 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 no. One man and his dog. Come on, canine. Now that is the kind of heroic nature I like to see from the Doctor. Oh, and I have to mention, it is awfully lucky that during his infiltration mission, he just so happens to stumble into the little side room where the baddies left the key to timepiece just chilling on the table. And the last thing of note that I wanted to discuss was the final confrontation in the form of a duel, a sword fight. Now, these have been very hit or miss over the years of classic Doctor Who. Many a time have I had to lament on the abysmal swordsmanship on display. They did get a lot better when John Pertwee came into the role, but I seem to remember whenever the last sword fight was, they kind of slipped back into mediocrity. Like that one time the first Doctor, again inexplicably, has a sword fight and disarm someone with ease, like, ah, yes, I am trained, I'm awesome. And I guess he just loses that, and then when John Pertwee comes into the role, he's like, I, I know how to fence. And so does the fourth Doctor, I think. Well, it was a nice surprise to see that they are once again back on top form, with proper choreography and an actual point to the fight. It's not just a fight scene for the sake of having a fight scene, but part of a greater event with other characters interacting and going off and doing their own important things and a whole siege is happening at the same time. And it goes on for quite a while too. And you can tell that Tom Baker was getting a little bit too into it. Well, nothing groundbreaking, and it certainly could have used more music to break up the, the, the scuffling and sword clangs. It did turn out to be quite a nice bit of excitement to wrap up the story. And yes, the final little gag of poor canine floating aimlessly in a boat left me with a big grin and a hefty chuckle. So yeah, definitely worth a watch, and definitely better than the Stones of Blood. <laughs> Thank you very much for your viewership. As always, it is greatly appreciated. Hope you enjoyed the review, and now it is time to check out the one I've been looking forward to the most out of this season because of the gloriously cheesy DVD cover, The Power of Kroll. See you next week.